Um, but we do have Maxwell uh, and Kim. They can talk to us about, uh, well, Scott Maxwell here, he was one of the lucky individuals who got to drive uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers. Um, so thank you so much for being able to join us, uh, Kim and Scott. Um, could you go ahead and introduce yourselves? Yeah, um, so I'm Scott Maxwell. Um, I, I was uh, one of the original eight rover drivers uh, for the Mars Exploration Rover mission and was the Mars Rover Driver team lead for that mission for a number of years um, before I went over and uh, drove Curiosity around for, for a while as well. So I've, I have recently left JPL, um, but, uh, but did that for just you know, very nearly 10 years of my life. Um, so, so I have a, a vast experience and uh, uh, stories and so on of uh, spacecraft operations and all that good stuff. I'm uh, still at JPL, and I'm the SAM Instrument System Engineer on, uh, for MSL. So um, I'm, I'm uh, slightly, I'm kind of half on the science side, half on the engineering side, and I work with one of the most complicated instruments we've sent to another planet. This thing is a thing is a beast. Yeah, the thing is actually the most complicated instrument I believe we've ever sent to another planet. The, the, that one instrument, um, the SAM instrument, is so large that it will not fit into the MER chassis. It's like basically too big to be the science payload. That one instrument is too big to be the science payload of the entire Mars Exploration Rover project. Yep. It's actually really three instruments in one. It's actually three scientific instruments in one, which is this is amazing. It's three, three, <laughs> three, three instruments in one. one. <laughs> so <laughs> you guys are a little punchy, uh, aren't you? <laughs> oh, poor you! I, what you're doing I, is awesome. We're totally in support of yeah. this. <laughs> So, so one of the great things uh, about the Mars Exploration Rovers and now with Curiosity is all the data is going online, all the imagery is going online, and this has led to some really neat data usages, um, ranging from the not real Yeti that was found on Mars to the <laughs> not real lizard, um, to the accidental moment of porn with the what with the tire trails. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I so the that, first question, totally, I, I have amazing. to ask, were you the one who, who drew the accidental porn on the surface of Mars? Um, it, is, it, is a, it is a complicated story, but I was one of the people involved in that, yes. Um, that was mostly done by uh, one of the other rover drivers, but I did have a, um, I hate to, I, since you phrase it that way, I hate, to, I hate to put it like this, but I had a hand in it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find the, this picture. And to... we've gotten stupid again. <laughs> <laughs> we need up and down in our silliness in this show. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, she finds the picture. So, so I, while I bring your more embarrassing moment up, I, <laughs> you, how, how has it been to be part of a mission where you know the public are out there and they're getting your data and they're going to do amazing things with it that you can't anticipate? That's, to me, I mean, uh, Kim's also part of that mission. I'll let her speak to it as well. But for me, that was just a phenomenal thing to do. Um, I, 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 um, I loved, you know, driving rovers around on Mars. It was the, the kind of thing that I grew up dreaming about as a kid. And it's a great thing to get to do. But if I were just, you know, if they just turned me loose and, like, gave me the keys and let me drive the rover around on Mars, that would be really cool. But what makes it so much better is the idea that there are anybody in the world who wants to ride along in the back seat can. And so, you know, we're putting all these images, um, uh, 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 you know, as soon as we take them, we, you know, they go through an automated process and they're, they're, they're up online. And other people can see everything that we're doing and can kind of ride along in the back seat and, and comment on it and, and make, you know, prettier pictures than we can make, high definition yeah. versions of the images and, and, you know, beautiful panoramas that we just don't have time for and stuff like that. And, and to see what other people do with those images has just been absolutely amazing. You, you want to yeah. talk to that as well? No, I, uh, so on MSL there are um, 400 scientists and we have way too many, way more pictures coming down than, than you know, than all of our scientists can look at at, at once. That sounds so familiar. I think it's yeah. awesome that there are members of the public who can see images before, you know, see and, and play with images before before our scientists have time to get to them. And I, I just think that's... That's awesome. And nowadays you have, you know, apps on your phone or your tablet or whatever where, you know, you can just be on the go and, you know, you can be at work and you take a 10-minute break and, like, look at the latest images from the rovers. 
um, or uh, 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 very often, um, and this is this is now true of MSL as well as it was true for Mer for a long time. Um, uh, we're working Earth time, but the pictures don't come down from the rover necessarily at the start of our day at 9 a.m. So the pictures might come down from the rover at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you know, you as somebody who's following along the missions um, might see these images before we, the team, do. Um, it was a very common experience on on Mer for us to wake up and find out that not only other people had looked at the yeah, that's that's that's, that's my doing. Yeah. Um, it was uh, it was a very common experience for us on Mer to, to wake up and find out that not only had other people been looking at the images before we did, um, but they had actually uh, uh, you know made beautiful panoramas and stuff of them uh, 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 yeah. as well. That that particular image um, we did that in two thousand four. And it became a news story this year. So it took nine years for them to discover uh, what we had drawn on the surface of Mars, and I think that's completely unacceptable. Um, I really, you know, I kind of expect more from the people who are looking at our images. They really ought to, you know, Come on, get more creative. We went to all this trouble to draw that on the surface of Mars, and it took them nine years to figure it out. Come on. You know, I, I gotta admit, though, as much as my mind is in the gutter, I saw that image. Like, I think I saw it in Nerdist. Put it up on Pinterest, and I was like, "Oh, cute! It's the surf. It's the surface of Mars. I wonder what that's all about." I had to look at it two or three more times. <laughs> so, you know, some of us, it just doesn't click. That, that, <laughs> this is a common occurrence with you. With the number thirty-seven <laughs> asterism in our virtual star parties. That was my favorite moment of Nicole pattern recognition fail. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm sure Fraser will show the video. Well, I, I think I think probably the kindest interpretation of that would be that um, when you're looking at space images, that part of your brain is not necessarily turned on, and so you, you know, just you know you, yes, oh god, it's it's really difficult to to avoid stumbling over puns when you talk about this, uh -huh. but, but so that part of your brain is not active. Um, and you know you've got times when that part of your brain is active, and then times when part of your brain is not active. And your mother would probably be very proud of you that that's true. <laughs> no, actually, you've never met my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, I was so close. She would find it just as funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, get your mom in this hangout. Yeah, what the exactly. hell is she doing right there? Sorry, mom. Love to meet her. <laughs> I just taught her uh, Skype on a smartphone, so we're not up to hangouts yet. <laughs> okay. All right. Good soon. Maybe next time we do this. We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah, because you've got me intrigued now, and I really want to meet your mom. Yeah, I know. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, yes, I am. Poor <laughs> <Or> mom. <laughs> You're completely sidetracked. So I'm going to show a Yeti on Mars. You know um, what she's doing is... now? She's looking through all the other images for more porn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she found the Yeti. All yeah. right. All right. Space porn. No. Yeah, so this is a really good one. If you can, I don't know if you can put that up large. Yeah, um, we have it up large. This is a great example. Um, there's, there's a lot in all of our images of something called, mm -hmm. uh, a phenomenon that you guys are probably familiar with called pareidolia, um, where you, you're, it's, the, it's this really f fascinating phenomenon. It's, your, your brain is so good at pattern recognition that it will see patterns that aren't there. Um, and so we'll see faces that aren't really there. If you if you think about how 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 simple it is for like you know your typical smiley face, right? Two dots and a, a curve like that. Yeah. Um, like your brain will interpret that as a face, and when it can interpret that as a face, there's all kinds of things it can interpret as a face or as you know other patterns mm -hmm. and so on. Yep. And this Yeti was a, a, a great example of that. Um, it's actually not just one rock; it's two rocks. And they're they're offset from each other, one like well behind the other. So if you see it from a different angle, they will they will actually separate and, and become uh, like visually two rocks. Um, uh, but uh, uh, but as seen in this image, you know your your brain is able to sort of like you know make a single uh, um, uh, single phenomenon out of that. This is the, this this looks just like the the infamous Patterson Gimlin film. Of you know, yes. supposedly of of Bigfoot, right? Yeah, it, it, exactly it, right. Yeah, it does. It does. But you know, we've taken uh, what uh, Murr has taken three hundred thousand images or something like that, and and MSL is you know rocketing up with thousands and thousands of images as well. And when you take that many images of a bunch of rocks, occasionally some of them are going to fall into you know, you, and and you have hundreds and hundreds of people or thousands of people looking at them. Um, pretty soon, you're going to come across something that looks to somebody like uh, something familiar. Um, you know, there are enough familiar things in your database, and 
they're they're going to match up. And of course, it also has this property that like once somebody has pointed that out to you that like that looks like a yeti, like you can't unsee that. Yes. Yeah. You know, like once they tell you like look at this thing that looks like a yeti, you can't not see it. It's yeah. like um uh um somebody pointed out to me that um duck bills, you you got to you got to like take a picture of a duck, look at a duck because if you look at a duck bill, a duck bill is a dog snout. Um, it's got like the eyes in the right place and the, the, the length of the snout is just right and so on. And once you've seen that, you can't unsee it. You can't ever look at a duck again and not see a dog snout. <laughs> Dog face. Dog, dog face, face, yeah. 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 In, the, in the bill. You've ruined ducks for me. Thank you. You've right. ruined the surface I know. of Mars and ducks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dale, is there Dale anything Jacobs. else I can ruin for you uh, while I'm here? Sure. I'm sure there's lots. Uh, Dale Jacobs uh, points out, hopefully... If a fossil is ever seen on Mars, it's not actually interpreted as parent only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, a, that's a that's, I never thought about that. I never thought about that either. But that's something we would have to be really careful to. Yeah. to uh, you know, that's that's one of the reasons why we have so many different scientific instruments on board is so that we're not relying on just one. Um, you know, to to you know, if if. Curiosity wasn't sent to find life, but to find evidence of habitable environments of life. And even that, that can be really hard to do. Um, so that's why we have the suite of instruments that will work all together to, you know, confirm that we found a habitable, habitable environment. And I think they've, they've said they've already found one. Uh, we found one with, uh, we found some clays, so that's, that's pretty exciting. You know what they should do with the next rover? They what? should come up with a scientific package because um, we've got dinosaur bones here on Earth, mm -hmm. and they should come up with a scientific package that is like able to recognize dinosaur bones, and we'll just send it and like drive around look for dinosaur bones. I like it. And if it finds one, it can be we can know that it can be like the instruments can work together. You know, what we to need? do like that paleontology ground penetrating radar. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, Raman's yeah. Got drama no, Raman, Raman can only see really uh, short underneath okay, the surface, so, but so, ground so penetrating deep radar penetrating. is yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's what. Can use to find, uh, you know, dead bodies buried. In the I'm totally sold. Let's make our own. Uh, let's make our own okay. mission. Well, let's let's I propose totally it to, uh, to 2020. That. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry, we're having our own little yeah, hangout sorry. over here. <laughs> no, it's cool. It's cool. Dead cool. bodies. What? <laughs> <laughs> this happens all the time with yeah, the two of us. I'm so we sorry. just kind of get lost in our own world. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're having fun. We're also so just to to give a shout out. Um, the the jungle fire who was on this morning, um, they came back to our house a and pretzel showed up. Uh, apparently, there's a that whole bunch like of pretzels pretzel. downstairs. So they've brought us pretzels to help get us through this hangout. This oh nice. You know, That's we awesome. we cannot thank the people who've been finding creative ways to help enough because uh, we we had Steve send us coffee. This is from my show. Uh, so it, it's Steve from facebook.com slash it's my show. He sent us <laughs> coffee. We now have pretzels from the Jungle Fire. So that's oh, Bandcamp, uh, ju the junglefire.bandcamp.com. And this is going to keep us going and seeing all of the tweets of support, all of the Google Pluses of support, and the money. Um, yeah. That's wow. so, so being. Mars rover driver, being a Mars rover driver and being a team scientist, you're somewhat immune from the funding cuts that a lot of the rest of us live in fear and dread of, but you were in institutions that were facing these cuts all the time. Yeah. Does yeah. it make it harder to do your jobs when you know that the people that you work with could lose their jobs at any moment due to Congress changing the budget? So uh, JPL, at least for, for those of us who are working on active missions, are usually fairly good about uh, insulating us from those so that we can do our job and and, and focus um, but it is always in the sort of the back of your mind that you know once you, you know spacecraft don't live forever they're yeah. they're mechanical things things are gonna break down like you know spirit but um, so it's 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 always in the back of your mind like you know if if the budget cuts go through and there's not a whole lot of planetary funding you know once this mission is over what am I gonna work on so yeah, and we I have I have actually known like JPL went through a round of layoffs end of last year, and it's been through rounds of layoffs before. And there is, you know, I mean, like you come into work one day, and like this person you used to work with just isn't there anymore, yeah. and you're like, that person was like really good and really smart, and they really like helped and contributed to the space program, and like all of a sudden they just lost their job because the money just wasn't there for them. Um, and you know that it, it it does really happen, and I'm, you know it's not 
if you're a member of the public, it's not visible to you how much that hurts the space program. Yeah. Um, just random people getting kind of booted out. People are, are irreplaceable and they have, you know, a, dozens of years of knowledge and they've got, you know, they know where the bodies are buried and they know how to get things done and they, you know, they understand instruments really well and so on and like, and like they're just not there and that, 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 that when that keeps happening, there's a, 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 a and the phrase that comes to mind is an attrition effect uh, uh, with the with the program. It you know it it, it kind of hollows it out. It's yeah. not really obvious at first that you're hurting it, but you really are hurting it. it. That's the part that scares me the most about budget cuts. I mean, if you so think, it, it's hard to it's hard to think about it in normal terms. But an analogy I just came up with, like think about making a movie. So you have mm. all of the all of the the crew, the background, the photographers, the um, you know. Uh, the costume people, and let's say that like they all lost their jobs and they all left and went to do other things. And let's say, okay, all of a sudden the money comes back and you're ready to make a money, you're ready to make a movie, and but you can't get all of those people back. And the people who are coming in don't have don't have that same knowledge and it takes a lot more startup time to get to the point where you were whereas if you just had like something to to you know keep the people working yeah. on you would have been right there ready to make that movie so well and and the next concern that comes into this and this is something that we're really worried about right now with uh, science education is it can take years to more than a decade to build a network of people right. yeah. that have a network of trust as well. So you have a lot of science educators who have worked to build up networks of libraries that work together, to build up networks of teachers who work together and who support one another and when we have projects we go to these networks to distribute the information all across the United States and when we need to find out what they need we have lists of people that we can say look there's this new mission going Going on. We want to do something to help you teach the science that's coming from this mission. What is of the most value? Well, we've built those networks. We have those networks in place. And if NASA's science education gets zeroed, this means programs like the Solar System Ambassadors, the Night Sky Network. All of right. these things are in jeopardy. Well, I know. Terrible. Yeah, I completely agree. And and you can um, you can see what happens when uh, when you actually make a sustained commitment, um, you know, you make a sustained commitment like like President Kennedy did, yes. and within 10 years you can send people to the moon. You just have to like be willing to stick with it and like actually see that through. You know, fund it and keep the mission the same and so on, kind of all the way through the mission. Um, with MER and MSL, you know, we were lucky enough to have sustained multi-year uh, funding commitments um, that, that actually made those missions get through. Um, uh, but but you're right. I mean, you know, the there's there's this current like shakeup in that system that that threatens to to ruin possibly for you know if, even if the shakeup is six months, it could ruin things for as you said like ten years um, and and put a crimp on the plans. And there's so many people. Um, you know, I was inspired by the space program growing up, and like that's why I grew up and like went into the went into space. Uh, you know, space exploration. And there's so many people who get inspired by what we do. And there's so many you know universities that have Mars rover challenges and things like that um, to get people into science and technology and engineering and math. Um, uh, and 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 it's it's you know when when you when you disrupt that, you're you're really eating your seed corn. You you can foul up that entire pipeline. Um, for for decades to come, and then of course there aren't educators to bring you know as you said there aren't educators to bring more people into that pipeline in the future. It has this you know just this terrible ripple effect. So, one of the things that I I've loved watching with with your team is science education is a profession. There are people who are doing amazing education research. There are people who understand the learning needs of school children. We need to respect and and nurture this profession as being another part of the science community. But you guys who are down in the trenches, you have first-hand experience of what it's like to debug problems, what it's like okay. to creatively find solutions to while trying to get spirit stuck, unstuck from the sand. And, and you take your time, not time that you're paid for at work, but your free time to, to give back to the community and share what you learned. And, and even though it's no longer your job, you're still willing to come in and help us understand what that was like. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're very passionate about it, and you can imagine why. If, if, if this were your job, you'd be passionate about it too. 
you know, I, I grew up wanting to do it, and I feel I I always felt I was very fortunate to get into a position where I was able to do that, and I I had a responsibility to give something back to the people who are making that possible. Yes. Yes, that's, uh, oh gosh, that's something I was taught early on is like, look, if we're using, you know, money from, from taxpayers to do the science, right. let's share the fruits of that. You yes. know, that right. is part of your job is communicating and educating. And, and yeah. I took that to heart. Absolutely. Absolutely yeah. agree. Good for you. Good for you. Well, thank you. Um, I, I wonder, <laughs> do you watch Big Bang Theory, Scott? We watched I, a couple episodes. Yeah, I think we, we made it through the first season. My okay. my companion gave me the first season, so yeah, yeah, so we watched that together. There's a bit of there's a bit of Mars rover driving. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've seen that episode. <laughs> How'd you feel it's about not that? Like that? It's not really like that. That's not how it Women works. Don't fall all over you because you drive a rover. <laughs> well, some of them do. Oh. <laughs> 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 Okay, I was wondering how you felt about that, but you haven't, you know, crashed it or anything. So. Uh, no, fortunately, <laughs> um, uh, that was it's 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 a really funny TV show, and I enjoy it very much. Um, uh, if the the thing about it is, it obviously has to depart from reality because reality is not nearly as funny as that TV show. Yes, that's um, true. That's so. true, but but it's scarily like reality in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, the the thing is, the the they they draw a lot from reality, and the places they draw from reality yeah. are are spooky accurate. Yes. I I swear to God, I'm not kidding you about this. Uh, uh, the character Sheldon in that show <laughs> is totally totally me. Is is like dead on. No. Like like I no. swear to God, the writers no, no, of that show like, reached into my brain and made somebody who was exactly like me. It's spooky. Yeah, there was actually. Not Sheldon. Sheldon. <laughs> No, no, actually, I can, I can second that. So, yeah. um, so we were watching an episode, and there was, there was, there was, uh, we're sitting like Sheldon and somebody else are sitting at the table in a restaurant, and somebody said, "No, no, no I feel nauseous." And then Scott and Sheldon say at exactly the same time, "It's nauseated." <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, get that, get that one. one. Yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> awesome. I'm warning you. Oh, that's funny. Oh, that's oh, funny. funny. Well, bringing well, up bring my, up my mom, mom again. again. She, um, she, she, she uh, yeah, came to dinner with a bunch of my friends and I after, after my defense, defense and, uh, and uh, said she said felt, she felt like, like she was sitting in an episode of Big Bang Theory. Theory. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> in that way, that too, which is like reality. Oh, did, did you feel that way at dinner after my defense? Um, no, okay, but I hadn't good. seen the show yet, so uh, probably, yeah, probably if I had, have. yeah, uh, yeah. But but see, her people are all like geology nerds. Um, and there, are, there isn't too much of that on the on the show on Big Bang Theory. There's 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 all kinds of like math and physics nerds and stuff, but not yeah. not like geology nerds. So yeah. So, so do you, do you like, like your gravity, gravity loopy or, or stringy? Or stringy? Um, I uh, I I like uh, loopy stringy gravity. I'm kind of a combination of those two things. Yeah, it's yummy. Mm, a, a big a, like a, 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 a I was just drinking a glass full of chocolate milk, but if I'd thought about it, I would have had a nice glass full of loopy stringy gravity. That would have been really good. Oh, uh, we just got the five-minute warning from Google uh, saying the Hangout will be terminated in five minutes. So that's the end of this four-hour block. So we'll be scrambling to set up a new one. So everyone watching, stay tuned. Um, we will tweet the link and we will embed it in the main event page. You can also go to the CosmoQuest Hangoutathon Part 3 event. We'll embed it there as well. So just a warning, uh, five minutes before Google kicks us off and we have to start a new one. And uh, we're going to then do a 15-minute segment, which Nicole's going to handle on Terra Luna. Yep. And then we're going to do making planet-shaped cake, cake pops. pops. So, so I'm going to have, have to go, to go set, set up our set in the kitchen. Um, another, another, no, that's not what that was. <laughs> Can I not, not read? read? Oh, oh, we have, we have Sigler, Sigler, and then, and then we, have we have cake. So during so the 15-minute, I'm, I'm going, going to go set up, up then we're then going to do Sigler, and then we're going to do cake pops. So, so just so I know, do uh, do Will Wheaton and Spock stay with you through the entire broadcast? Little Will yes. and Party Spock are here in the broadcast. Yeah, right on. And so, Captain, Captain Chuck the Squirrel. The squirrel. Oh, the oh, oh is that that was. I was going to ask. Okay, right on. Cool. So, do you guys have any any last message or last word that you want to uh, give to people before Google shuts down? Um, I, I I do. I just kind of wanted to remind people that um, uh, you know exploring other planets is 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 useful and kind of valuable in and of itself because it's just good to know things as an abstract good, but it's also useful to explore other planets for the same reason that it's useful to read biographies. You read biographies because they tell you about another person, but also because that learning about other people helps you learn about yourself. 
and you explore other planets because that helps you learn about other planets, but learning about other planets helps you understand this one better. Mm -hmm. And since we're going to be stuck here for a while, it would be a really good thing to understand this planet better. And that is, in a nutshell, my, my personal, my single strongest argument for why we should fund planetary science. Um, because it, may, it might not be obvious to the average person in the street, but it is really helpful to us right here at home for living on this planet. Excellent. 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 I love, I love it. it. It's a it's great, great lesson to move to our next, our next segment, segment on. on. Okay, <laughs> hey, so thank you thank so you much. So much for having Thanks so much for having us. Yes, thanks for having us. And and more power to you. You guys are you yeah. guys are awesome. You and Will and Spock there are just doing a great job. Yep. Rock on. <laughs> Thank you so, thank you much. so much. Everybody, Everybody stay tuned for the new YouTube, YouTube link. link. We are we ending are this ending broadcast with already a new one. Bye. Bye.